Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a man called Peter, who is calling about a used car, and a woman called Tina, who is selling the car. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, it's Peter speaking. I'm calling about the ad you put online for a used car. Sorry, what was your name again? Oh, sorry, it's Peter Smith. Oh, hi, I'm Tina. Good to hear from you. So tell me, which car are you after? I'm interested in the sedan, the 2012 Toyota sedan. We have a few of those available right now. Let's see, was it the Black Pearl one or maybe the Barcelona red one? Oh yes, I saw the red one, but I don't really like red cars. The one I'm after is silver. Right, I see. Okay, well, what would you like to know? Well, it says in the ad that it's in good condition. What does that mean exactly? Well, the paint is original. There are almost no scratches or dents. It looks like a new car, in fact. There was a tiny scratch on the door, but we polished that right out for you. Oh, that's good. How's the engine? The engine? Ah, oh, yes. Well, there haven't been any problems, and it's been serviced regularly, you know. Oil changes, lubes and so on. The previous owner was a very careful old lady and she looked after it. It's only had the one driver. Oh, except that on the papers it says two owners because her son took over the ownership when the old lady stopped driving. How about the tyres? Are they in good condition? I do a lot of driving on the open road. Well, they all passed the car safety test. You might need to replace the back ones in the next six months or so because they're a bit worn. But the owner had the front two replaced only a couple of months ago. So those ones are new. You won't need to replace them for ages. Oh, and it had new brake linings recently too. I have the garage receipts for all of those things. OK, that's good. And what extras does it have? Well, air conditioning, of course. And there's a nice stereo which plays CDs. Or you can use it with an MP3 player. Mmm, what else? All the usuals. Power steering, central locking, ABS brakes. Oh, and it also has a tow bar. You can remove that and store it inside the car when you're not using it. Mmm, what else? You know it's manual transmission, right? Yes, I don't want an automatic. And the tow bar sounds great. I need that for carrying my bike. OK, well, that all sounds very cool. And you're asking $25,000, is that right? No, no way. <laughs> I think you must have the wrong ad. This one is 30000 and we won't go lower than that. Hmm, I see. What's the mileage again? Most cars of that age would be around 80,000 kilometres or even up to 120,000. But as I said, the old lady didn't drive much, so it's very low. Only 50,000. You won't get a better low mileage car than this one. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. OK, well, I'd like to come and see it if that's all right. Where do you live? I'm in the suburb of Pembrose. Do you know where that is? Sorry, can you say that again? I'll just check on my GPS. Yes, I'm in Pembrose at 352 Hunter Place. H U N T E R. Oh, yes, I see. Yes, that's OK. It's about 30 minutes' drive from here. No, that's no problem. So, when would you like to come? How about this evening? I could come at 5 pm. Oh, no, sorry, I forgot about my gym class. How about 6.30? Does that suit you? Look, sorry, I have someone else coming then. Can you make it a bit later? Say, 7.30? Well, OK then. But that's getting a bit late, really, and it'll be dark by then, won't it? I'd really like to see the car in daylight, if that's OK. Well, then, how about 4-ish? Yes, that's good. OK, let's say 4.30pm. And I guess I'll just have to be late for the gym. I'm usually very punctual, so being late just once won't matter too much. Yes, fine. See you then. Oh, just in case there's a problem, what's your mobile number? Oh, of course. It's 09-367-8192. Um, ignore that. It's my landline. Of course, it makes more sense to give you my mobile. That's 045-352-7652. Got that? Excellent. See you later, Peter. Yes, sure. Bye, Tina. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a receptionist, Doreen, talking to a group of parents about the Daisy Daycare Centre. First, you have time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello everyone. I'm Doreen, the receptionist at the Daisy Child Care Centre. Thank you all for coming to our open evening. I'll just show you round and tell you a bit about the place. First of all, I will have to ask you to leave your sneakers and sandals etc. here on the shoe rack, just inside the main door. You know how the young ones love crawling around the floor, so our policy is no street footwear inside. As you can see, our facility is very open plan. There are lots of different activity areas, and we like to have pretty good visibility throughout the centre. This central area to the left is where we all gather for stories, songs and some games. That's why the big circular carpet is there. Everyone comes to sit there two or three times a day. I can see some of you looking at our TV. Some parents worry that we might just dump the kids there to watch rubbish all day. But of course that's not the case. In fact, we only use it occasionally. For example, we use it if we have a story on a DVD. And then we get the kids to do a bit of acting based on that. That bookcase there beside the TV gets a lot of use, though. Some of the older kids choose to sit and read or look at picture books in their free time, but we never allow them unsupervised TV. If you look along the wall on the far side of the little gate leading into the main room, 
you can see our kitchen play area. It has lots of utensils, pots and pans. And that cupboard closer to the corner is the dress-up cupboard. That's a very popular area, with the boys as well as the girls. You'd be surprised how much the boys get into acting and make-believe. Now over here, opposite the gate and behind the big lunch table, are the sinks and the painting area, and then the doors to the outside. To the right of those outside doors, you can see hooks and little cubby holes on the wall for coats, bags and outdoor shoes. The children can keep slippers in there, but most of them run around indoors in their socks or bare feet. If you can bear it, I think we should pop out into the cold for a moment to have a look round outdoors. We'll just stay under the veranda. The sand pit is over there at the far left of the outside area, and that box next to it is storage space for buckets and spades, and lots of trucks and diggers to push around or even ride on. The slide beside that is popular, and so are the three climbing walls over by the fence. Some parents think that's a bit adventurous for preschoolers, but the older ones love them. The ground is covered with bark, so it's not a harsh surface when they do fall. The ordinary swings and a tyre swing are here in front, where we can keep an eye on everyone, and then the chickens are way over on the far right, so they can have a bit of peace and quiet occasionally. OK, so let's go back inside and I can talk about our rules and policies. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. As you probably already know, the government sets limits on adult-child ratios, but we try to improve on those wherever we can. There are different ratios for under and over two-year-olds. For the under twos, the rules are one adult to four children. And we basically stick to that, except that we have an extra roving staff member with no allocated children who helps out wherever there's a need. The older kids have a 1 to 8 ratio, and again we try to have an extra staff member on site. All of our staff are fully qualified, but we do have trainees from the local polytech at certain times of year. We do have pretty strict rules about pickup times here. It's a real problem if parents are late and we end up with far too many kids for the number of staff. So we ask you to be very punctual about collecting your children. We have had to ask a couple of consistently late parents to leave, but of course this is only a last resort. We have quite a long waiting list here, especially for the over twos, but you're welcome to put your name down. The average lead time is usually about nine months, but sometimes we get unexpected vacancies, for example, maybe a family has to move to another city for work or something, so their child is withdrawn. This means, if you're lucky, your child could be admitted in three months or so. Now, are there any questions? That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between a business student called Marco and his personal tutor about the courses that Marco should take. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Hi, Marco. Come in. Thanks. I've got a bit stuck trying to select courses for next semester. Could you help me, please? Of course. Sit down. Oh. First of all, most people just go for the areas of business that they're interested in. But even if something doesn't look very stimulating, it's important that you can use it once you get a job. It's not much good choosing areas that aren't going to be helpful later on. Right. I want to go into management, so I'll need to think about that. And should I start specialising in a particular area yet? I don't think that's wise at this stage. It's better to aim for a wide variety of subjects, especially as management covers so many possibilities. You shouldn't be limiting your choices for later on. Yes, I see. You should also look at how the course is made up. Will you have regular seminars and tutorials, for example, as well as lectures? OK. Some of the lecturers are quite big names in their fields, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Should I aim to go to their courses? Well, remember that the lecturers who aren't well-known may still be very good teachers. I'd say we have a consistently high standard of teaching in this department, so you don't need to worry about it. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30, Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Good. Well, that's a great help. Now, last time we met, you mentioned doing team management, didn't you? That's right. I'm still quite keen on the idea. Mm -hmm. The trouble is that because of changes in the content of various courses, team management overlaps with the Introduction to Management course you took in your first year. Oh. So what you learned from it would be too little for the amount of time you'd have to spend on it. I'll drop that idea then. Have you had a chance to look at the outline I wrote for my finance dissertation? I left it in your pigeonhole last week. Yes. Why exactly do you want to write a dissertation instead of taking the finance modules? It'll be pretty demanding. Well, I'm quite prepared to do the extra work because I'm keen to investigate something in depth instead of just skating across the surface. I realise that a broader knowledge base may be more useful to my career, but I'm really keen to do this. Hmm, right. Well, I had a quick look through your outline, and the first thing that struck me was that you'll have to be careful how you set about it, as the way you've organised it seems unnecessarily complex. The data that you want to collect and analyse is potentially valuable, but you'll need to narrow down the subject matter to make the whole thing manageable. OK. I'll have another look at it. I was talking to Professor Briggs about it yesterday, and I got some more ideas then. For part of the dissertation, I was thinking of trying to persuade finance managers from three or four companies to let me ask them about their company finances. Mm -hmm. If not, I think I'll have to change to another topic. Well, go ahead then. I could give you some names. Thanks. Now, let's talk about practicalities. Your dissertation must be finalised by the end of May, so you should aim to finish the first draft by the end of March. Is that feasible? Yes, it shouldn't be a problem. I'll need to register for the dissertation, won't I? Is that with the registrar's department? No, it's internal to this department, so you just need to let the secretary know. Do that as soon as you're sure you're going to write the dissertation. OK. Then, to analyse your statistics, you're going to need some suitable software. If I were you, I'd drop into the computer office and ask them for a copy. Right. So, if I revise my outline... That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk about a research project on the tiger shark. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 38. Now listen carefully and answer the questions 31 to 38. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the research project I've been involved in on the tiger shark. First of all, some background information. The tiger shark, also known as the leopard shark, is often thought to have got its name from its aggressive nature. But in actual fact, it's called that because it has dark bands similar to those on a tiger's body. It is a huge creature, growing up to lengths of six and a half meters. It can be found just about everywhere throughout the world's temperate and tropical seas, but it is most often found along the coast rather than the open sea. In terms of feeding, tiger sharks tend to be most active at night and are solitary hunters. Their preferred prey includes other sharks, turtles, seabirds, and dolphins, to name but a few. However, it's not uncommon to find garbage in its stomach. This is because it tends to feed in areas such as harbors and river inlets, where there is a lot of human activity. Now to the project itself. We are particularly interested in some studies that have been done in the Rain Island area. Observations here have shown that there is a large population of tiger sharks present in the summer during the turtle nesting season. However, during the winter months the sharks disappear. So we decided to do some of our own research there. The first step was to tag a number of sharks so that we could follow their movements. To do this, we first needed to catch the sharks. Early in the morning, we baited lines with large bits of fish and set them in place. These lines were then checked every three or four hours. If no sharks were caught, the baits were replaced. Once a shark had been caught on one of the baited hooks, it was pulled in close to the boat and secured so that we could carry out a number of brief activities to aid our research. This usually took no more than about ten minutes, and was carried out as carefully as possible to minimize any stress to the shark. Each of the tiger sharks that we caught was measured and fitted with an identification tag, and also a small amount of tissue was taken for genetic studies. For some larger sharks over three meters long, we also inserted into the belly a special acoustic tag capable of sending satellite signals, while on other large sharks we attached a camera to the dorsal fin to enable us to study the behavior and habitat use of the sharks. After this, the shark was released, and we were able to follow its movements. Now you have some time to look at questions 39 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer the questions 39 to 40. So what was the purpose of all this tagging? Well, while we were already familiar with some aspects of the tiger shark's behavior and food sources, what we hoped to do in this project was to see exactly what factors affected the migration patterns of tiger sharks, 
and whether it was in fact food, weather, and reproductive needs. These are some of our findings. On February 21st, a large female shark, whom we named Natalie, was attracted to our research boat at the northern tip of Rain Island and fitted with one of the satellite tags I've just mentioned. No transmissions were received from Natalie between April 2nd and April 29th, indicating that she didn't surface to feed during this period. The area in which she was last reported is very shallow, suggesting that she may have changed her feeding preferences during this period to focus on prey found on the sea floor. We also made a number of other discoveries, thanks to the various transmitters we used. It seems that tiger sharks move back and forth between the ocean floor and the surface quite often. This may help the sharks conserve energy while they swim, but it probably also helps them hunt, since this movement back and forth maximizes its chances of not being detected by its prey until the last minute. So far our findings have not been conclusive. However, we have gained some very interesting insights into the behavior of tiger sharks and are now hoping to develop our research further. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.